I wanted to address a question that keeps coming up from individuals and students. A question that has been addressed to me uh, during the last three or four years. Um, and I notice that it is still there, uh, bothering people's minds and creating agitation. More than just questions. So I wanted to talk about Goenka and whether it is the Dhamma that he taught or that it teaches, the Goenka movement. And um, I've addressed this um, in previous correspondences with individual uh, students in the past. And I will look at some of the things that I've mentioned uh, to them regarding this subject, given that uh, it is the same topic and uh, things haven't changed as it relates to what this movement has been doing, started by Goenka himself. There's a, there's a book called McMindfulness that I've read some time ago by Ron Purser, uh, a wonderful book that talks about the uh, monetization and, uh, and how mindfulness uh, merchants have been showing up feeding off of the Dhamma and uh, selling or presenting whatever they uh, feel or going in Goenka's case uh, felt that would be um, helpful for them to advance their own ideals and ideas and um, we see that um, such a mindfulness merchant um, is found within going to himself. There's this uh, modern capitalist uh, system promoters where you have uh, individuals who psychologize mindfulness, where they talk down to the person where they it, it's all about the person in the sense that if something's wrong with you know the life that you're living then you're responsible for that completely um, excising the outside um, such as you know the corporate social responsibility doesn't exist that promotion, that movement that we see in postmodernist and neoliberal capitalist uh, um, dominance that we see in the world today, we see that um, being fully supported in Goenka. You know, he was a big promoter of the World Economic Forum. He was even a speaker on their panel. <laughs> so let's not be fooled. Uh, and... Uh, you cannot bring the Dhamma into the World Economic Forum uh, given its uh, positions, you know, WEF's uh, position uh, that go exactly contrary to the Dhamma and anything that is decent and anything that is human. So it is, uh, it's, uh, it's an oxymoron. They don't work. And uh, Goenka was a promoter of those neoliberal capitalist values and uh, you know it, it, we have to say it like it is and um, for example he was also known to again and again 
dissect mindfulness from the Dhamma in the way he would call it uh, from what I remember because uh, I've done his courses in the past uh, where he would say the benefits of Buddhism or the Dhamma without all that other uh, cultural mumbo-jumbo that were added and usually he would re be referring to the Sangha and uh, and others um, over the centuries so he was quite disrespectful as well uh, in reality within his circles uh, not when he was uh, in Myanmar or Burma or meeting some very famous Sayadaws so uh, or teachers Buddhist monks so we need to be careful with uh, Goenka and not just go ahead and uh, really treat what he did or his person as someone who is uh, or was uh, living, living for or promoting the Dhamma. Far from it. Uh, <laughs> looks are deceiving, uh, definitely. And, uh, and of course, many people will not like uh, what I'm saying here, but the facts are the facts. You see, Lord Buddha warned us about the uh, end of days for the Dhamma. He talked exactly about characters and fake teachers like Goenka and others. He called them eel wrigglers and uh, those who speak adhamma but present it as dhamma adhamma is the opposite of dhamma what is true what is just he kept on saying that uh, i mean goenka uh, that what he was teaching was dhamma when in fact it was simply the opposite of it although he would use the terminology um, uh, left and right, but if you're just a person who walked off the street and came into this thing that uh, you know they're offering you free lodging and free food for ten days, you're like, yeah, sure, sign me up. Most people are doing it like that, and if you have some uh, emotional, uh, psychological, or just uh, issues, and then some. You know, you're not feeling okay or have questions about your life, that's very enticing, especially when you hear that, oh, we're not going to be talking for 10 days or so. So, this is very uh, intriguing for the average common person. And that person is not going to be going and um, exploring the suttas, they don't know what the, what the word sutta means the discourses of Lord Buddha, or they don't even know what the Vinaya is, where we find the Dhamma, the original teachings of Lord Buddha. So people would just come in, and they still do, obviously, and will continue to do so, <laughs> I think, uh, for some time, because of the appeal that the franchise that he started has. So, and they're not going to question him. They're just going to sit there and put up with all that is thrown at them and imposed upon them. And the Adhamma, they will come to accept as Dhamma. Unless something happens and they make a, you know, uh, they inquire or they want to go deep. Um, for some reason, something in them, there's, there could be seeds of um, pursuit of the Dhamma, genuine pursuit and desire to know the Dhamma that they might have had, either from this life or from previous lives, that might get triggered and they would go deeper, want to go deeper, but they will not go deeper or deep even there within the Goenka institution, which is a Dhamma. So, the person is not going to be uh, comparing and contrasting to see if what Goenka was teaching, uh, behaving like his actions, his words, which kept on switching uh, from setting to setting, uh, 
um, and what Lord Buddha was teaching. So everything should be out in the open and we shouldn't have um, secrecy. And we see a lot of that in Goenka. Not everyone has the dedication to analyze by um, studying uh, what Goenka said, therefore. And in this age of extreme mediocrity, uh, people will continue to swallow whatever is thrown at them as meditation. We need to look at the person's morality, first and foremost. That was missing. That is missing. Unless the person, individual person, brings that with them. For example, you, you do the... Um, on the first day of the 10-day retreats, um, these franchises I mentioned, um, you just do it the first day, you just mention uh, the first day and that's it. Meanwhile, the person is going through so much, so many um, challenges, because it's an unnatural environment, not because of the uh, the agendas of the day, let's say. We sit from this hour to that hour, there's lunch, there's, there's breakfast, or there's this, or... Not those. But the way the, the unnatural environment of imposing this adhammic atmosphere, where people cannot even smile to each other. So... But I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, a bit more. So Goenka, well, he was a fake and a promoter of Adhamma for his own ulterior motives and those of the neoliberal capitalist puppeteers at Davos, <laughs> Switzerland. So, uh, so he was a promoter of the World Economic Forum agendas that are run by the corporate model and uh, which lack any genuine social moral responsibility. Like I was saying earlier, uh, they do use um, very flowery and, uh, you know, pro-humanist uh, 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 um, words. Um, they use such words uh, that are flowery and fake language but while truly following a Marxist uh, style of leadership, our way or the highway, um, so which, which one could clearly see in the way those who attend the so-called Vipassana courses um, you know, do experience. So when you hear him uh, speak, just like the way you hear, let's say, any other um, guru, uh, like Satguru and, you know, Eckhart Tolle and all those characters, um, what you're hearing is a lot of filibuster, just a prolonged talking with no substance, trying to not offend anyone per se, except, of course, the Dhamma itself, as he kept on chipping away at it leaving nothing but a monotonous, robot-like, lifeless teaching, which he equated with science, uh, which he apparently knew not much about, just like the Dhamma, that he knew not much about. So there's uh, Hindu and incoherent chants and disturbing mantras that uh, um, you hear him chant, which have nothing to do with the Dhamma again. It's, uh, what it does is it induces a sense of um, hypnosis in the, in the listener. And it's not a comforting type. It's very disturbing and it's detrimental to a healthy state of mind. You don't want that kind of uh, disturbances, um, especially during meditation. So I've done those courses and I would just wait for him to just shut up. To me, just to, 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 they would stop the tape, and it's like, 
it's just such a nuisance, such a, you're already working with hindrances. So the last thing you want is some, um, you know, low pitched, um, in many ways, it, it, because I knew Polly and um, I was, when I first went to the course years ago, I, I knew the chance, the Pali chance that the Sangha, the monks, um, the bhikkhus would chant. And this has nothing to do with them. But what I noticed was it was negatively impacting the emotions. It's desensitizing, creating an almost zombie-like state where the body is pushed to its limits in the absence of Dhamma. So, not many people have that perspective when they come and join. And if this is the only thing they have experienced, then it's going to be a rough ride. They're going to attach themselves to it and consider that as Dhamma, and everything else second, including the suttas. This is a sad situation. This is, well, what a, what a charlatan does. So, and no, his lack of Dhamma never allowed him to even share some Dhamma, as it lacked the very humanity uh, which exudes from the Dhamma. And this you still see in his 10-day courses, or, you know, Satipatthana, or the 45-day courses and whatnot, and which is a funny, a sad thing, like these courses, these numbers, these random numbers that people started to treat like, you know, which is, an, again, uh, an aspect of gulping it down, and, and it's, a, it's a cult. You don't see that in the suttas. Every day is a retreat. Every day. So it's not 10 days. Why, why not 11 days? Why not 9 days? Why not 8 days? You know? So these courses are very militaristic. One-dimensional. Blindly. Blindly. Being forced to what he had instituted. Which, you know... There's this, you know, coming from a narrow and culturally rigid vision, again, that is totally unrelated with Buddhism. The courses uh, are geared so that participants are forced to extricate, remove themselves from any semblance of humanity from their hearts, where they avoid even smiling, like I was saying earlier even towards oneself, let alone to others. So it's very militaristic, lifeless, empty of the life-giving energy of the Dhamma. I would always sneak a, a smile here and there. Oh, you're not even allowed to raise your gaze so that, oh, by accident you might see someone else. So as you're walking through a hallway, um, you know, and you see, you're looking and you're seeing someone's shadow approach or you're seeing someone's feet uh, as if this is going to help in any way. Instead of looking at the mind, it is an outside in approach. It's terrible, it's lifeless. It has nothing to do with the natural flow of Dhamma. And if you want to look for a cult, there you go. The imposition of such nonsensical, unnatural rules. Oh, you have to sit like that, you know, uh, uh, you have to eat only this. Well, why is that? Why can't there be some, um, you know, different type of food? For example, you know, I'm a Buddhist monk, it, it, it really doesn't matter, but intelligence and wisdom lack and there's a lot of lip service but no substance other than to strive and strive and strive and strive and become rigid and rough in one's meditative practice this is not dhamma 
Lord Buddha never taught like that. In the thousands and thousands of suttas that we come across in the Nikayas, you don't see that rigidity. So what the Goenka movement, the cult, is doing is continuing this Adhammic tradition of theirs. They're promoting this lack in all flexibility, lack in softness, lack in kindness, and the natural organic flow that is the Dhamma. And all those meditators who have somehow kept their softness and still smile throughout all that, all that that is being imposed on them, have made it thus far in spite of the Goenka method. Because there's still a thirst for Dhamma in their hearts, waiting to reach fulfillment, but will not do so so long as they're still attached to this Adhamic teachings of Goenka and the life that he led. He had a lot of talk, but nothing being said, no one addressed. When you hear him talk or when you watch his videos, you see that he was trying to please those with influence. Just a lot of smoke and mirrors. No teachings are offered. Although they claim to even have ATs, assistant teachers. I have yet to see anyone teaching anything. Because anyone who sat through any of those courses knows them to be just a joke. No Dhamma there either. No proper instructions for students experiencing real issues, real personal issues and questions that come up that need personal guidance. You will not find that. Unfortunately. So Goenka used the language of charlatans, playing on the vanity and conceit of materialism. The, as I was saying, the postmodernist Marxist in the way he established his franchise. You see it through and through. There's no Dhamma there. Except for when he mentions uh, this or that sutta, it's almost like a camouflage. But then if you know these suttas, if you've studied these suttas, and uh, you know, um, you've practiced proper meditation, you will see. Because all that is dropped in the way the whole Goenka system is set out. Unfortunately, it was an embodiment of deception uh, because of the wanting to spread his franchise. You know, the, the globalist, uh, anti-humanist one would say, because what one would experience usually is a sense of um, well, when you don't smile to yourself, you're already becoming anti-humanist. And it's an illegitimate uh, state. That one, it's unnatural. And what he was, he was an illegitimate teacher. You know, Uba Kin, his own teacher, that he claims that he placed him as in charge. He had other students, you know, much more advanced than Goenka also from India, when they lived in, in Myanmar, in Burma. But he had the business-like mentality to approach this and really see where he could take this. And he was not interested in taking the Dhamma. He was using the Dhamma as a cover for his guru desires, to become a guru, which is exactly what capitalists and you know, technocrats and autocrats, uh, you know, self-proclaimed gurus do. He was just another different face. So, you see, you had the um, Rajneesh uh, uh, in, the, in the 80s, uh, early 70s and 80s, 
And now you have Satguru or Eckhart Tolle of today. Um, and for a few decades, the world has had Goenka, just another guru, even though he would just pretend that he's not into that and he's, he's away from that, he's with science, all that, all lies. And uh, I say these things because they need to be said, because there are so many thousands of individuals who still go to his courses where there's no personality change taking place, where there's no purification of morality taking place. And that is a big red flag. A huge red flag. And when that is missing, the sila, or hiri, we call it, wise moral shame, and uttapa, wise moral fear, within the individual, then anything goes, which is what we see around us. He was once asked about, oh, uh, you know, businessmen and, and, and corporate corporations and the greed and all that. He was very dismissive of the question. And he was, again, eel wriggling. He was just you know, using a lot of words, but basically saying there's no difference between a person who is, you know, uh, a businessman who's running after greed or creating an empire and one of his students who's striving so much, basically, to attain or to understand what he's presumably teaching. He leveled the field. He created neutrality, at least in his mind, and in the minds of those who follow his cult blindly. He didn't have anything of his own, you know, nor the creativity to start or make something new. He just capitalized on what his Vipassana teachers, the true teacher, Uba Kin, was teaching in Myanmar. So he just basically stole from the genuine Dhamma he was being offered. But to spread his own guru aspirations, pursuing his selfish and capitalist goals. So it's quite shameful, really. We must always look at and trust the behavior, not the words of someone even if they sound true or could be traced back to some genuine source, like the case was. I mean, if you go to the Goenka organization and you try to see, you know, you see this on YouTube, you see it at Pariyati and all these, um, you know, the headquarters and all that of the, of the movement or the cult, you see them always tracing his lineage down, giving it authenticity, as it were. Obviously, Ubakin and Sayaji, and, but they also use Webu Sayadaw, an Arahant. While the corruption of an organization is the corruption of the organization and the person on the, at the top, Goenka, cannot uh, be dismissed by bringing in, or as they say in, in, in America, uh, dropping names, you know, uh, O Webu Sayada, O Uba Kin. Each of these individuals were working on themselves. And you cannot keep using their names to give yourself authenticity or validity to be a Dhamma teacher. And that's what he was doing. His whole life was about that. So we always have to go back to the person's behavior, as shown by the person's actions, including their words. Especially when we look at the underlying patterns over the course of time. So these are sadly... Um, uh, 
facts um, that indicate the opportunities that Goenka had, but he lost. Um, because he was entrusted with the Dhamma. Um, every time we speak on the Dhamma, we're being uh, entrusted. So we have to take care of the Dhamma. It is not a tool that we use to promote our goals, and that is what Goenka has done. Which indicates clearly that he himself never had tasted any of the supramundane paths and fruits of the Dhamma, despite what his blind followers uh, claim. He was not even an Acharya. I don't know who gave him that title, but uh, during his, uh, uh, you know, he was known uh, during his last years, he was known, at least uh, as far as I know, as an Acharya, which means a, a teacher of Dhamma, and his knowledge of the Dhamma was mediocre at best. But most people don't know that. They don't have the time. So I want to really address this once and for all because it still keeps coming up. So again, as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm using some of the um, uh, notes that I've also, I'm going over as I'm um, responding to this question because I've addressed this in, in, in uh, different correspondences with uh, students in the past. Because this is an important, very important subject, given what the world is going through, because we are under attack as a population. It's not just the physical health, the civil liberties that are in, in danger and have been for some time, especially during the last two or three years. But we have been under attack on the spiritual front as well, and most people don't talk about this or know about this. There's this movement that's happening to manipulate the Dhamma. And for that, the gloves, one of the gloves was Goenka. The hand that moves the glove, you know, the dirty work. And this is not a conspiracy, this is just a fact. You look at the person's work and you see and you compare. And Lord Buddha always said, if you have doubts, always go back to the suttas and the vinaya and then compare them with your own personal experience. But you use those as your resource. You never use, whether it's Goenka or Rajnish or some other teacher or myself, it doesn't matter. You have to go back to the suttas, the teachings of Lord Buddha, the original teachings found in the discourses. Do they match? And we also have Lord Buddha stating in the Vimansaka Sutta from the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length discourse is number 47, how we owe it to both ourselves and to the sasana to investigate the teacher, whoever they might be. Whoever they might be. Unfortunately, however, what happened with the whole Goenka movement is that it just became that. His own movement, a cult an extension of his business franchise model, where being a Hindu, nothing wrong with being a Hindu, by the way, but when you're selling yourself as a promoter of the Buddha's teachings, that doesn't go together. Okay? You cannot be a Dhamma teacher and a Hindu. It's not, it doesn't work. So he sought to grant himself that add a title of a guru. People call and refer to him as Guruji, Guruji, you know, openly. When I was in India and other places, that's what they say. Calling him, oh, Guruji said this, Guruji said that, Guruji said this. So he himself, even while he was alive, he encouraged the development of a cult-like following, where he came first and the Buddha second. He came first. And the Buddha second. Meanwhile, the Dhamma, which he uh, re, I guess you can say, re Hindu if there's such a term, as Dharma, 
And that's another thing. He would take the Pali words and he would turn it into the Sanskrit, which was a no-no even at the time of Lord Buddha. He scolded. Lord Buddha scolded a couple of uh, monks uh, who were scholars and uh, in love with the Sanskrit language who came and said, Oh, Bhante, we have to change the language of, of the teaching of the Dhamma. It's because it's so beautiful, it has to be encapsulated within an equally beautiful language like Sanskrit. Lord Buddha scolded them, chastised them, said, you fools, you idiots. The Dhamma is for everyone. The Dhamma is for everyone. So Sanskrit was left out. And, but here we had Goenka tweaking, trimming, and removing from all that Lord Buddha had carefully and meticulously delineated as being separate from all that was being presented in the contemporary India, nearly 2,600 years ago. So, unlike what Uba Kin, and definitely what Webu Seda, which Goenka has nothing to do with, by the way, despite his organization's efforts to kind of give him legitimacy, he went ahead and presented a very homo homogenized, yeah, neutered uh, form of Dhamma by taking Buddhism entirely out of the meditative practice and mor moral uh, structure by turning it into some secularized version that would become uh, not only palatable but uh, ingestible and even to some extent enjoyable by the masses. Just like I was mentioning um, Ron Purser's book on McMindfulness, um, his franchise, Goenka's franchise, is like McDonald's franchise, except that it would be presented under his initials, S. N. Goenka, instead of the Golden Arches of McDonald's. So it is a shame that Goenka not only brought in and promoted the guru culture into the Dhamma, but in fact, in his public displays, especially in Myanmar, in Burma, he would show respect to the monastic Sangha, making sure his pho photographers were there to snap a photo or two of him, as he was doing, you know, the hands in Anjali together in front of his chest, to bowing to this or standing in front of this sayada and that. But when he was amongst his own people, or in his own recordings, or where he was just being himself, he would not only minimize the Sangha's importance, but even mock or belittle the bhikkhus, calling them unnecessary, redundant, and as those whom he considered to have presented an institutionalized version of what he thought Lord Buddha, another Hindu, whom he considered another Hindu, basically, Gautama Buddha, uh, which uh, Lord Buddha had intended in his teachings. So he was uh, calling himself like a purifier or somebody who's a reviver of the Dhamma, bringing it back to its land, of a place of origin. So, according to him, he believed that he was the savior of Lord Buddha's teachings. Imagine the ego that the man had. At one point he was saying that only Myanmar or Burma had some of the Dhamma intact. And now he was bringing it back to its, you know, land of origin, India. Apparently he was not even aware that the Dhamma was very much alive and well in Sri Lanka, in Thailand, along with um, Myanmar, where you had and still have genuine Arahants, by the way, who are the living embodiments of the Dhamma. Goenka, with his uh, subtle yet very strategic manner of running a business, pulled out the very spinal cord out of what he began to teach, the Dhamma. As he presented 
his own version of it, the secular kind, so to please and therefore get access to more audiences unobstructed, unhindered. This is what led to his franchise of 10-day retreats with zero expenses or costs. And who could deny that? Who could say no to that? Well, at least some curiosity. So you go and you try it. So that's why we have a, uh, you know, those franchises attracting countless people to come and try this very unusual practice. But what many people don't realize that Goenka also tried to monopolize Vipassana itself, claiming that his version is the purest, the closest to what Lord Buddha taught before these intellectualizing monks polluted it, as he would discuss in his uh, tapes during these courses. So it is no surprise for us to witness how today, within the vast global, global Goenka community, that you have a somewhat of a conceited and holier-than-thou attitude in many of his students, and a deeply held belief that the Bhikkhu Sangha are not, nor could they ever be, truly practicing as they, Goenka students, are practicing the genuine teachings of Lord Buddha. This is ugly. This is sad. And this is the responsibility of their teacher. And of course themselves, because the teacher is dead and gone, having to pay for, actually, his misrepresentation of Lord Buddha's Dhamma, because no one could escape the punishments that are to come. The con we don't like to use the word punishments in, in the Dhamma, but just the consequences. Meanwhile, his students believe that he actually attained any, you know, Nibbana. Far from it. So, on so many levels, in the absence of Samaditi, which is right view of the Noble Eightfold Path, Goenka's wrong views have caused him to lead many students astray, even though one must also state that because of his 10-day retreats, some participants might, like I was saying earlier, wake up certain old wholesome seeds or merits from their past. So this also has to be said. So we shouldn't throw the baby with the bathwater, as it were. You know, there's there's good people there too who go and try and and it sometimes even if if they're newbies in the meditation uh, uh field and and they're trying something but something doesn't mesh well they they feel something they feel attention meditation need not especially the whole retreat the 10 day course the outcome should not be the fact that you just finished and yes, now we're out of Shawshank, you know, we're, we're out of, of prison. And, and no, that shouldn't be the case. Nor the happiness that comes because you're no longer going to be pressing and pushing and torturing yourself. That's not meditation. But there are individuals who will start asking questions. And they're the ones who will come out looking for the Dhamma proper, outside of the cult-like following he promoted, as they leave it behind and come to put an end to suffering. I remember in his millennial address at the UN some years back, Goenka even went ahead and kept using the term Almighty God, Almighty God, a few times, while avoiding the proper mention of Lord Buddha and his message. And instead, he kept on promoting the <laughs> wonderful benefits of what his franchises provide to people. All the while making sure to not offend anyone sitting there, all the other religious representatives, by stating anything remotely considered as true Dhamma or as Dhamma. Meanwhile, when you go to the 
going uh, uh, cults, uh, you know, main website or uh, some of those outlets. And, and uh, one time I saw um, uh, the um, transcript of the talk, the speech he gave at the UN. I was like, wait a minute, is that what really, he, you know, what he said? So I read and there was no mention of Almighty God in the transcript. And in it, it was very pro, in a sense, uh, Buddhist <laughs> in some sense. So I was like, maybe I misheard. And then I found the video again on YouTube and I watched the whole speech he gave. Guess what? It's a totally different thing than what they're presenting on the website. This is again another example of misrepresentation. In fact, it's not misrepresentation. It is falsehood, breaking of the fourth precept. This is a lie, misleading the public. And he was a big deceiver, a true performer, a very efficient and self-serving neoliberal capitalist businessman slash guru of the modern age with direct connections to the World Economic Forum, period. He was someone who had a desire to captivate and entertain an audience while mangling, destroying the Dhamma and its values as he catered to his listeners throughout his speeches. We have to understand that Goenka was born a Hindu and he died a Hindu after having lived and taught as a Hindu while trying his best to repackage what Lord Buddha taught as Dhamma. Again, there's nothing, you know, this, this need not come across as um, criticizing the religion of Hinduism. That's, this is not it. But to be trying to represent Lord Buddha's Dhamma while being, you know, of a different tenet and faith and belief, that is wrong. Because in doing so, he not only misrepresented the Lord Buddha, but he disrespected the triple gem, the three trainings, as he left behind him a set of ready-made, one-size-fits-all type of answers for his so-called teachers or assistant teachers to provide question, you know, uh, answers to questions of generations of newcomers that were to come despite the individual nature of the questions they might have, the students. Meanwhile, the TA, or AT, I think they're called, from what I remember, would just fall back on responses, ready-made responses, like, well, Guruji explained it uh, like this, or Guruji on day seven video says it like that, so you should just be paying more attention to Guruji next time, so go and practice. What kind of a instruction is that? In any context, in any, even a kindergarten teacher gives you a better uh, answer than that. What nonsense. This is a big sham. Because truly they're not guiding the students nor providing genuine support that is abundantly available in the suttas, in the discourses of Lord Buddha. You have it all there, you know. So what you have, unfortunately, is these genuinely curious students often begin to doubt themselves, which is a classic case of gaslighting and being manipulated. So aside from his hypocrisy, self-overrating, both in his meditation and in his lack of understanding of the Dhamma, his superiority conceit and genuine lack of and respect towards um, the triple gem. His genuine lack of respect towards the Dhamma taught by Lord Buddha that was passed down to us through 26 centuries thanks to the Sangha. There are much more to be said about Goenka. But the one thing that many are shocked by is that on all of his franchise locations of the 10-day retreats or courses, 
you will never find a statue or a representation of Lord Buddha placed as a sign of respect, as the founder and originator of this path except for the picture of the chakka or the wheel that is also used on the Indian national flag. This is sad. This is blatant disrespect. But in the absence of Lord Buddha's image or statue, or even a picture of the Bodhi tree, you will, however, most certainly find a set of large twin comfortable, empty chairs. Guess for whom? For both himself, Goenka, and his wife. Even post-mortem. Imagine that. The ego of the guy. The conceit. And you also will have a chair or two for the on-site uh, AT, male and female assistants, who actually never teach, but always forego and default back to his earlier tapes, as I was mentioning. So, talking on or about the Dhamma does not equal knowing and living the Dhamma. Okay? So, despite the fact that Goenka repeats the words, middle path, middle path, he was the farthest from it. As demonstrated by how, during retreats, meditators are talked down to. Where there is this culture of putting the blame on the person pushing and pushing the individual throughout the retreat, where many come out, if they can manage to finish the 10 days, with even more strengthened egos, renewed superiority conceit, and more questions than before, along with a general sense of confusion. Once those post-retreat two or three days are gone, elapsed, Organizers and often servers of these courses, uh, his franchise retreats, unfortunately also lack in their own understanding of the Dhamma. Not to mention their ethics, their morality. I personally have witnessed old students, that's what you're called, once you finish one course you become an old student, which already it means like your status is now a little bit higher than the common person outside on the street who's never done these courses. I've witnessed these old students curse, cuss, talking about going out to party and uh, drink afterwards, going to orgies. I heard from students and other, um, from, from these old students, that is, even when I was in India, such despicable and unwholesome acts like stealing wallets and purses while on retreat, while in, in the course of the 10 days or the Satipatta, people were getting their items stolen by other meditators. Even doing and, and, and selling drugs in some cases, drugs, marijuana, and other substances along with other questionable moral behavior in, in, in many instances, uh, such as um, wanting to interact and, and engage in sexual acts. Well, what is that? If not a major lack in individual responsibility. There's no hiri, there's no ottapa, there's no wise moral shame, there's no wise moral fear in the person. This is wrong. Such institutions should just be locked. It's just like, you know, they shouldn't function anymore. Like this. There needs to be sila reintroduced. There needs to be responsibility taken by these uh, individuals running such courses. There have also been cases where an individual, uh, well, one case that I know of, where a person in California even committed suicide after having finished the Goenka course. 
I think she had uh, done it on the, uh, she's, she was from California, but she did it, I believe, uh, on the East Coast. Uh, I forgot which state, but possibly Ma uh, Boston or somewhere. Um, terrible story. So it creates psychosis within the mind of the person. Even though they now started instituting, oh, uh, putting the psychological questions, but there isn't the support during and after, especially. Because you're creating psychosis in the mind of the person. So none of these things have been or are being addressed properly by his organization. Again, sadly. And um, finally, although I've participated in the retreats myself and uh, closely associated with other so-called old students in the past as a layperson, I have failed to see any Dhamma in them, or in most of the direct students, some of whom used to go and sit in meditation with him. You know, one person said uh, in his uh, 70s that he used to sit with his back to Goenka. So they would sit back to back. I mean, that's how close uh, in, in, in India back in the day. But I also witnessed firsthand their wrong views. This is, this is not supposed to happen for someone who's been meditating for 45 years in this Dhamma and discipline. Something is wrong. And no, it's not the Dhamma that is wrong. There's a lack of respect that I've seen again and again in these individuals, either towards the Lord Buddha his words within the Pali Nikayas, or even in the possibility for a person to truly become awakened in the first place, such as any of the eight categories of the noble disciples. One time I remember in India, uh, a person even started laughing at the end of uh, reading a section from the Sutta, which I was so happy that they were finally reading a Sutta, and uh, the person, there was one, it was one of those suttas where at the end, um, it says how at the end of this discourse, 500 people attained uh, sotapanna status and uh, 100 people attained, let's say, I'm, uh, I'm giving random numbers here, but um, sakadagami and 50 people attained um, anagami and five people became an arahants basically. And the person said, and he was a meditator within the Goenka uh, cult for over 30 years at least. And uh, he said laughingly, like, yeah, 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 yeah. We know how that goes, but we know that that doesn't exist anymore. It's just mumbo jumbo. My jaw dropped. I'm like, what? Then why are you even here? What is this then? Why are we doing this? Why are we in, in this group meditating? There's hypocrisy of the worst kind. So, I know I said a lot, but uh, this is important, and I wanted to just wrap this thing up and, and not address this anymore, so that in, in the future, when someone asks my, for my opinion on this, and whether he was um, a genuine teacher or, or not. And by the way, there's, there's more and more people now coming up and to the front line and just say, wait a minute, this, there's something wrong here. Especially because there's more Dhamma now than there was 10 years ago. Um, people have more access to the sutta, so people are waking up. So I just want to put this audio out this recording out so people could hear it and and make up their mind but again go and check the sources meaning the suttas and then look at his life all these things that i'm pointing out about goenka check excuse me check to see if if this is if this really uh, agrees with reality and if it does what are you waiting for get out of the cult 
Stop being so attached. Use your head. This is your life, not Goenka's. He's dead and gone and he's paying for his Akusala actions, you know. And it's pretty hot there, by the way, where he's at. Very hot. <laughs> Just remember that not everything that calls itself Dhamma or shines is in fact Dhamma or is to be seen as gold. And Goenka's teaching, in essence, had nothing to do with the Dhamma. It was and continues to be a cult. Unless, of course, the meditator somehow finds their way being dissatisfied with what they're witnessing, truly trusts and follows his heart as it seeks out the teachings of Lord Buddha. Minus, of course, the Goenka obstacle. Because that's what he was. An obstacle. And for such a heart, a willing mind to trust the heart, my wish for it is to finally get the chance to delve into the true teachings that are found within the suttas, where we see the humanity of Lord Buddha, the kindness, the compassion, the softness, the flexibility, the organic nature of his teachings, the love of a mother teaching us, guiding us, which is the Dhamma, which is based on the pillars, the three pillars of sila, morality, samadhi, mental cultivation, and panya, panya, which does not exist in this whole Goenka business. It's a business. Let's say it like it is and not be afraid. So the Dhamma has its color. It's not neutral. It's not gray. It's full of life. So let's know. Let's call things the way they are. Unafraid. Courageously. Because this is your life. This is your life. And make choices accordingly. And don't look back. Trust your heart. Trust the Dhamma. Trust your experience. Stop living like a coward. Lord Buddha was never a coward. The legacy he left us is not for cowards. Cults are for cowards. Love is not for cowards. Nibbana is not for cowards. It is for the courageous ones. And may you be such a courageous one. Hmm.